Hey guys, so it's Corinne, your AI for discussion. If some of you, I know a couple of you emailed me that you just joined the class or just in case you don't remember me from our very brief first discussion section. So I'm here with a giant picture of my dog, Howitzer, to bring you some problem solving tips and tricks and a little mini lecture video series to hopefully help you guys solve your physics problems and just give a little extra direction and help for those that need it. I do have my iPad here, so if I look down, I just need to refer to my notes. Um, so this very first video is gonna be going over kind of some general tips and tricks, I guess you could say, and just recommendations for being successful in the class. Um, so I have taught the lab section of this class before, but that was many, many years ago, probably like five years ago, I think I said, um, on the first day. But in that time, I've been a private tutor, mainly for mechanics, either the algebra-based or the calc-based. So I have seen students struggle with a lot of these issues in the past, so they seem to be pretty common. Um, so if you're stuck on something, try referring to one of these videos to see if it might uh, answer your question. If you can't get to one of us, um, office hours aren't attainable, attainable for you or something like that. So in this video, we're going to be going over some math concepts that you should definitely be familiar and comfortable with um, using your calculator and then also labeling units and kind of general bookkeeping and organizational tips that you might not have thought of but actually come really in handy. So first and foremost, let's talk about math. So obviously physics is a really quantitative field and some math skills, a handful of math skills, are going to be essential to you being successful in this course. And obviously there were prerequisites for certain math classes to get into this course, but who knows how long ago those classes you actually took them or how much you've retained since then. I know it's really easy to forget some math concepts, especially if you're not using them all the time. So if it's been a while or you're just a little bit uncomfortable, I would say as soon as you can, Go on Khan Academy, look up a lesson for any one of these bullet points that you feel like, oh yeah, I could maybe see myself making mistakes there and could use a little bit of a review. They usually have video lessons and then quiz questions like real quick to kind of just like get your understanding up and running. So first on this list is going to be mathematical expressions and functions. So looking, I mean, the most simple example I could give is for a straight line that you probably used to, y equals mx plus b. So the backbone of physics is going to be built on equations, which are basically functions, but the variables all correspond to very specific physical quantities. So it's going to be really important that you understand how, what expressions mean and what they represent in the physical concepts and then also the math. Um, algebra, especially PEMDAS. You absolutely need to know your PEMDAS. So many of the equations, pretty much most of the equations are going to involve some sort of rearrangement or solving for a variable that's not explicitly already on its own. So you're going to have to know your algebra rules. Um, generally, I would say that you need to know the quadratic equation. Um, just in case there's not a ton of factorization that typically comes into play, but it could be an option for a more difficult problem. And just know things kind of like that taking the square root of both sides would get rid of a squared. So I'm actually going to cut to a screen recording of me going over. Three, two, one. Exactly. Quick, quick example of what is going to be important to know. Where the heck? There we go. So if you were, so this is a simple example, but again, just kind of knowing these basics, which sometimes people forget, um, is going to be important and will help you go a long way. So 
we have x squared equals 4, but I need you to solve for x, the way that you would get rid of the squared is by taking the square root of both sides. So that gets rid of the squared, so you just get x, and then the square root of 4 could either come from squaring a positive 2 or a negative 2. So we have two values that we could get for x there. So just some pretty basic math on there, just your basic algebra. Um, the next thing I would say that you need to know is to know your exponent rule. So this isn't going to be as prevalent, but there are are going to be some sections, especially if you move on to 202, but there's even some sections in this class that because of the way that the units were set up, we are working with either really large numbers. So if we're dealing with gravitation of planets, that's really large masses and really large sizes. So you're going to be working a lot with powers of 10 just because it's a lot easier than writing out the full numbers. And so it could be useful to just help speed things along to be able to know what your exponent rules are and how to work with those powers of 10 and simplify them. If, say, you have a 10 to the 5 over a 10 to the 3, you know, you could rewrite that as 10 to the 2. So, again, just something to look, fo <laughs> to look forward to. Something to think about that you should review if you're not super comfortable with it. Um... Okay, and this, I cannot stress this enough. No SOHCAHTOA. So sine opposite over hypotenuse, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent opposite over adjacent. Gotta know that. Gotta have it down. There's going to be a lot of trig. There's a decent amount of trig in this class, and... You absolutely need to know Sokotoa and the Pythagorean theorem. I'm sure you know that. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Last for this math, math section, which also isn't going to be super, super prevalent, but I think is still important and can help just pad you up a little bit, is going to be graphs and graphing. So in your lab section, you'll have to graph more yourself. The other parts of the class is going to be more so you reading graphs and being able to understand them and do problems with them. And this is just kind of an essential skill. It's a useful skill to have, especially if you're planning on being a doctor because um, being able to read the equipment and things like that. So for this, I would say you definitely know how to, you should know how to find the slope of a straight line. Um, know the equation for a straight line, which I said earlier and yeah, just know how to read a graph, x-axis, y-axis. Um, you'll see more examples. I'll have a more in-depth, because I'm sure you guys will get to position versus time graphs, velocity versus time graphs relatively soon, um, and you'll see where this comes into play. So I'll have a whole, there will be a separate video specifically on those types of problems. Jumping off of math, you definitely need to know how to properly operate your calculator. Um, this seems like kind of a trivial thing to mention, but pretty all the problems that you're going to be doing are also going to involve you putting numbers into a calculator, possibly several times for a single problem. And each time you work with your calculator, if you're not super comfortable with it, that's an opportunity for you to make a mistake and to lose points. Um, or to just confuse yourself because what you have written on the paper is completely fine, but then when you go to type it in your calculator, you get the wrong answer. So I would say try to use the same calculator that you're gonna have on your test when you're doing all of your problems, just so that you can get familiar with it. And then you might need to check certain things or certain specific things I would say that you need to know that kind of a casual calculator user might not know um, is the way to input certain things. So the first thing I'll say is for trig functions, some calculators, they're going to want you to press the sign button and then you might have an open parenthesis and then you type in 30 and then it has a closed parenthesis. Um, the sine of 30 is one half. 
So that's something that you could go ahead and check and I will actually screen record on my iPad again and just show on my calculator that I just downloaded for this how it needs to be inputted. So if I do sine and then type in 30 and equals, nothing happens. So it's still just 30. But if I leave that 30 on there and then press sign, then I get one half. So for this calculator, I want to type in the angle in degrees and then press the trig function I want in order to get that out. Your calculator, most calculators, I feel like are the other way around. But just to show an example of that, another one that's huge is going to be the order of parentheses and using parentheses properly. So let's say that we need to take um, I don't know, what do we want to do? Let's say that I need to do 10 divided by, we have some, well, 10 divided by 5.5 times 3.3. I don't know. We rearrange an equation, that's what we end up with, and we just want to put it all in our calculator in one go, not have to do the, dom the denominator and then denominator and numerator like that. So if I do 10 divided by 5.5 times 3.3, .3, that's going to give me 6. But notice how in the little, what the calculator thinks that I did, it divided by the 5.5, .5, but instead of keeping the 3.3 .3 with the 5.5 .5 in the denominator, it popped up to multiply that whole fraction instead. So what we would want to do instead is do 10 divided by open parenthesis 5.5 times 3.3 .3, closed parenthesis and then put that in and get, I don't know, we'll round that to 0.55, doesn't matter. So that's just one example. Um, exponents is another place where this might come up if you have 10 to the 2 pi or something. If I do 10 to 2 times pi, let's see what happens. It just did 2 times pi. Okay. So then I have to do 2 times pi and then that. That seems right. Um, yes. So proper parentheses use going to be important for getting the right answer. Like I mentioned before, powers of 10 in the calculator can also be kind of tricky sometimes. So know how to use your parentheses right and kind of get those in. So sometimes um, there's buttons that look like little two capital E's or one capital E. I'll show some examples of what that might look like. That would be the same as 10 times. So if you wanted to do or 10 to a power. So if you wanted to do say four times 10 to the sixth, you would just do four E six. That would be the same thing. Um, being able to convert to and from scientific notation. So again, depending on which section of the book that you're in, if we're working with those really big or really small numbers, it's just gonna make your life easier sometimes and not be sitting there counting zeros after a decimal place. It'll just pop out and you can convert it into scientific notation. Um, and then last is gonna be converting from degrees to radians. So this is also sometimes usually topic dependent whether or not you're gonna be using more degrees as your unit for angle or radians for your angle but I can't even tell you how many times I still make this mistake because I'll be switching back and forth depending on what I'm doing with my calculator and then go to plug something in for a student and the answer turns out completely wrong because I'm just in the wrong unit of angle. Um, so that's just a common mistake. So, yeah. Um, those are all pretty common calculator mistakes. I'm sure I missed some. And I think that just knowing how to operate 
the tools that you're going to have on your exam is just going to help you in the long run and help you on your problems too. Okay, this is already 18 minutes long of me recording. But the last section, which I would say is arguably the most important section of this video, mainly because I feel like it never gets properly introduced or explained, especially at the college level of physics, and it can cause a ton of confusion. And that's going to be labeling variables, the units that go with those variables, and just general kind of bookkeeping and organizing your problem solving. So in addition to taking a science class that you're probably not super familiar with the field, now all of a sudden you have to go ahead and decipher all of these ways that these equations are typically written and the way that the concepts are going to be condensed into variables so you can then use them in these equations. So in addition to the variables, the numbers aren't just numbers, they're representing physical quantities and because of that there are units associated with them. And because of the finite number of American and Greek alphabets, or letters in the alphabet, there are often multiple meanings for the same letter. Um, there are also often only a few different ways, or there often are a few different ways to represent the same quantity. So I'll give an example because that kind of sounds abstract. So erase this. So the example I'm going to give is in a couple weeks you guys are going to learn about forces and one of the forces that you're going to learn about is called the normal force and it happens um, the normal force occurs when you have an object sitting on some sort of surface the surface pushing back up on is or the force that's going to push on that object from the surface is called the normal force and depending on the book or the professor, how they might want to write it, you could write the normal force as a capital N or F sub N, so F capital F with a little subscript for normal. So either of these could be used to represent the normal force. Um, either of these could be used to represent the normal force. Just to add to the confusion, it just so happens that the unit for forces is Newtons, which is also a capital N. So we have our unit. Newtons, which gets shortened to be a capital N. So you can imagine how if you're not super well organized with your page, all of a sudden you're going to have a bunch of capital N's all flying all over the place. And it might be confusing about which one is the force, which one is the unit. Oh, this has an N on it, so that makes it normal and things get out of hand very quickly. One thing that you can do and that I encourage you to do, um, especially for this last labeling tip that I'm gonna mention, is that if you need to, and there is absolutely no judgment because no one gives a crap what you write down on your paper. So if you need to write more to understand what the variables are, go for it. Like if you need to write normal for whatever problem, you're going to write normal force and then I'm pretty sure your book uses Fn, but I don't actually remember. I'll just go with Fn. And then Fn equals 30 newtons. And if you have, I don't know, let's say we have normal force and gravitational force. And then 
you have gravitational force, you're going to write down explicitly as Fg, I don't know, let's say equals 20n. Doing that if you need to for any reason is totally cool, especially as you're learning the symbols and what they typically mean and context behind them and all that sort of thing. Um, there's a learning curve for sure. And like I said, trying to understand and memorize all these on top of how difficult the course is already just can sometimes slow people down. So um, the last labeling tip that I want to mention here that will kind of relate to what I was just showing is a situation where you might have different quantities for the same physical measurement. So what I mean by this is, for example, since I'm pretty sure you guys covered position by this point already, let's say we have the position of, or this is the position equation. Go. Let's say that we have a problem where there's going to be either multiple objects that you need to use the position equation for. So it could be a car and a truck, it could be object one and object two. So then they're each could have different starting positions, different ending positions, different velocities. Or you could also have the situation where you have a single object, but its velocity changes over different time intervals. So then that would be, you know, you might have v1 for the first time interval and v2 for the second time interval. And being able to label these things and keep track of which number goes with which object is going to be essential to being successful at solving problems. So this is again where kind of the bookkeeping is going to come into play. So try and be as organized as you can. Um, I'll show a little, I mean, this will be kind of a continuing theme, especially as more specific tips as we get to certain topics. Um, there's just going to be certain things that come up. So right now you guys are learning about position probably all in one dimension. So it's either happening in the X or it's happening in the Y. In the future, you're going to have something moving in an arc. So it's going to have Y values and X values at the same time. And typically you're going to have to split those up um, into just Y components and X components. So something that I used to do and still do most of the time is that I'll write out, let's say for this, that we have, you could do car. I'll stick with my other example. And truck. And then you can either write something like that this is going to be x1 equals 50 meters, x2 equals 10 meters, or something like that. Or if you feel like that's not going to be clear enough for you, you could do xc, xt, or you can go ahead and just write the whole word out, x car. not X truck, X truck. So again, label however you need to label so that you could follow your own work and be able to use the equations the way that they need to be used to solve the problem. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, I think that that's all I have for this first video. So review your math concepts, learn your calculator. If labeling and notation might take a little bit. Um, like I said, we'll get more into bookkeeping tips. That'll be a continuing theme. Um, and then the next video is going to be a problem solving mnemonic to give a little bit more structure and direction to approaching solving problems um, in physics. So I'll go over that guy next. And I'll catch you guys on the next video.
and I'll see if I could get Howitzer to say goodbye to us. Not the picture, obviously. <gasps> Howitzer. Say bye to the kids. Oh, he's so cute.